to all of you joining via Zoom or the live stream on YouTube. My name is Christoph Niedermeyer, and I have the pleasure to chair this first Lens webinar on new directions in instrumentation. For those of you who don't know, Lens stands for the League of Advanced European Neutron Sources, and is a consortium of nine European neutron infrastructure providers with the aim to provide cooperation between them and to develop a coherent strategy to meet current and future demands of the scientific communities. Progress in instrumentation is of course key to the advancement of scientific knowledge. You know, we all know this. And the development of new and improved technologies. Sophisticated instrument concepts enable scientists to form experiments with greater precision or higher sensitivity to answer increasingly complex questions and to make sense of nature. The ability to upgrade the instrumentation of local facilities or to build completely new facilities such as the European Spallation Source in Lund also dictates to some extent the science that we will do in the future and vice versa. Recent upgrade programs at various neutron facilities have provided an emphatic demonstration of the creative and innovative technical and scientific abilities of the facilities and their staff. I just want to mention, you know, to start with my own facility, the SYNQ upgrade program here at the Paul Scherer Institute, the Millennium or the Endurance program at ILL or the second target station project at ISIS. And with this webinar, we want to share some of these exciting developments with you, the audience. Leading experts from LENS member facilities will introduce their ongoing work and their vision for even future developments. Today, Arto Glavic will present recent developments of uh, polarized neutron. Uh, it's now, I, I, <laughs> now I'm out of the concept, sorry. Of, of polarized neutron reflectivity. Before joining the Paul Scherer Institute, Arto worked at the Forschungszentrum in Jülich and the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. At the Paul Scherer Institute, Arto was lead scientist for the development of the reflectometer SDR that will soon be installed at the European Spallation Source in Lund. He was also part-time instrument scientist for the reflectometer Armor at the Swiss Spallation Neutron Source SYNQ. His personal research interest is in complex magnetism in oxide thin films. As of May this year, Arthur leads the PSI contributions to ESS as ESS project manager. Before I give now the word to Arthur, please be aware that the webinar is being recorded and streamed on YouTube, live streamed. For those attending via Zoom, I also want to point out some uh, possibilities and technicalities that you will have during the seminar. On your taskbar at the bottom of the screen, you should see a couple of important buttons. The raise hand button will allow you to signal that you would like to ask a question. Artwork's talk is organized in three parts and after each of them, you will be able to do so. Another possibility is the question and answer button. This will allow you to write down a question and uh, we will select some of them and they will be answered at the end of the seminar. And the final thing, Arthur also decided to add an element of interactivity. During his talk, you will be able to use the poll button at the bottom of your screen to vote on Arthur's questions. And now it's uh, the stages for Arthur. Arthur, please, we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Christoph, and uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present uh, uh, in this new webinar series, the opening talk. So as Christoph said, I, I'm gonna talk about the um, uh, reflectometry, but also other grazing incident techniques and the science we can do with it. And um, my talk will start with a general introduction to um, the experimental uh, geometry and the basics uh, of um, what's uh, uh, used in the neutron grazing incident scattering techniques. Uh, so everybody is on the same page. Then I will give a short overview of what can be done in the special case of reflectometry on uh, magnetic systems, which gives you an average uh, of the magnetism in a layered structure. 
uh, and then go into the technical advances that have been recently made and are, are uh, now being deployed uh, on different facilities that uh, give us what I call the specular intensity wars, basically uh, orders of magnitude increase in uh, intensities that will allow a lot of new scientific uh, experiments that weren't feasible today. And then I will show uh, some of the science that is now um, at the border of what we can do with neutrons or that goes beyond what we can do now, which is basically a setup uh, about what could be the future of grazing incident neutron scattering techniques, um, especially looking at the two new sources uh, of the ESS and the second target station of SNS in uh, Oak Ridge. So at this point, um, uh, we will show you the first polling questions to get you introduced into uh, how this webinar will allow you to, you know, to interact a bit um, and gi give us also some feedback. And so we will start with a fun question and uh, also getting some ideas on uh, uh, who I'm talking to and where you come from. And uh, while you're voting, I will start uh, with the introduction. So in, in general, a grazing incident experiment um, uh, uses a flat sample like uh, this one here, oops, that uh, is hit with a neutron beam under a grazing angle alpha i that is small between uh, uh, tenths of a degree and maybe five degrees, and therefore close to the so-called critical angle of total reflection. Uh, and if the outgoing angle is the same, like this red line here, you will call this specular reflection or reflectivity. Uh, if there's a change in the angle in the scattering plane, like here vertically, uh, this is off specular scattering, and any kind of arbitrary change of the angle would be the g sans scattering. As with other neutron techniques, the neutron can interact differently uh, with matter. First of all, with the nucleus, giving us the, the structure of a uh, uh, nanostructure. In, in the small angles, you are not sensitive to the atoms anymore. And so you get something like uh, um, a density of scattering length um, that uh, defines what's the scattering. And in this scattering, the spin of the neutrons is not changed and they scatter the same for spin up and spin down neutrons. If you have a magnetic material, that uh, has the same shape as a, a nuclear um, material and has magnetization parallel to the um, neutron polarization, then this uh, changes uh, the total scattering length of this material and uh, gives a difference between a spin up and spin down scattering. So the ferromagnetic part is the difference in the two and the nuclear part is, the, uh, is what's the same. If you have any arbitrary magnetic order like uh, this example of skirmion lattices. You can get any kind of non-spin flip and spin flip scattering. And if there's no interference with the nuclear structure, uh, the non-spin flip, spin flip channels are the same again as with the nuclear scattering, but you can also have spin flip scattering dependent on the direction of the magnetic moments. So, what can we investigate uh, with, with those techniques? Uh, in general, we are uh, not only seeing the surface of the sample, but also penetrating a little bit into the sample in the micrometer range. Um, the structure sizes are between one and 100 nanometers. If you go to off specular scattering, that's about two orders of magnitude larger structures that you can get because of the projection of the Q vector onto the sample giving a very small QX value and therefore long structures that you can see. Um, you, you can see the chemical and isotropic uh, composition of a material and you also can see the magnetic profile of thin films. And uh, if you're going off specular, you can also see nanostructures, roughnesses at interfaces, uh, embedded particles, magnetic domains, and also audit structures like artificial um, dots or something like this. A key difference between uh, grazing incidents and other neutron scattering techniques are the effects happening at uh, close to the critical edge of total reflection. 
that is uh, uh, mostly below one degree for, for most neutron wavelength and materials, where you're, uh, all the intensity is reflected. And close to that, you also uh, get quite a re uh, sizable reflection. So you have the reflection and refraction effect like in uh, normal optics. And the theory behind it is very similar. And so what you're getting is uh, the incident and the outgoing beam uh, being the same. And this is uh, orders of magnitude higher than any other scattering that you get in this range. And you can see uh, how the um, smoothness of a surface, for example, changes the difference between specular and off specular scattering, where a smooth surface only scatters specular. And there's also some off specular component if there's roughness involved. So, coming to what we uh, can measure in the specular reflectivity itself. Um, you, while you have access to uh, different elements that are in a film and they don't have to be um, homogeneous, uh, what you are measuring is actually the lateral average of the scattering uh, lengths in, pla in one uh, plane. So these examples of having like something like a homogeneous uh, matrix um, with some dots in them that are uh, on a certain ordered structure or having nanoparticles average uh, uh, distributed in this matrix uh, would not be distinguishable from a continuous layer of material. When you measure a single film on a single substrate, you're getting these kind of oscillations. Uh, here you see the critical edge of total reflection. And here this minima, the position is dependent on the thickness of the film. Um, so the thicker, the smaller, the, uh, the higher the frequency of those minima and uh, the uh, height of the minima and maxima is defined by the um, substrate to film contrast. And if you have repeating structures like, like this kind of uh, super uh, structure multilayer, um, you're getting uh, also break peaks coming up where the break peak distance is given by the uh, uh, bilayer period and the intensities of the break peaks uh, are defined by the contrast and thicknesses within the bilayer. So what can we uh, look into with this technique? Uh, I have set up a few examples. Those are uh, barely what uh, is the full science case, but just for, for an idea for you how this could work. Uh, so uh, one uh, field of active research is multiferroics. An example here, multiferroic bismuth ferrite on a ferromagnetic strontium manganite uh, uh, LSMO, uh, where you can use the spin asymmetry, which is formed from the spin up and spin down reflectivity measurements to distinguish different models like here, no magnetization and BFO negative or positive aligned to the um, LSMO magnetism. Another example would be um, uh, spintronics here with a manganese silica site um, uh, where in bulk you form some kind of uh, cycloidal uh, or helical structures um, where uh, it was investigated if this can be also formed in, in a uh, thin film and they found that they have a left and right handed uh, helical structure um, uh, mixed in the film using the spin flip scattering here. And there are also some effects that uh, where uh, magnetism arises just at an interface or um, near the interface. An example here is the uh, uh, superconducting um, uh, materials next to ferromagnetic materials that can induce uh, uh, low uh, ferromagnetism in the superconductor at the interface. Or another example would be um, having uh, two oxides that are uh, in bulk, both antiferromagnets, but if you bring them together, the interface itself uh, leads to electronic reconstruction that then produces a ferromagnetic metallic state in this region. And last but not least, you don't have to have homogeneous systems. This is an example of nanoparticles with some deposited cobalt, uh, quite disordered, uh, where they could find that only at the bottom they found magnetism not in the top region. So what are the challenges that uh, for the uh, magnetism community in reflectometry? 
the samples are limited in size, which means um, you cannot make uh, much bigger samples than 10 by 10 millimeter uh, in most cases, sometimes even less. This is limited by the preparation method, by the characterization like squid magnetometry, where you only have a five millimeter uh, space for the sample, um, by uh, the, the available substrate quality from a lot of single crystals is limited to this kind of sizes. And if you wanna to go to low temperatures and high fields, sample environment also limits your size. You also almost always need polarization and uh, in some cases also polarization analysis. And as the intensity of the reflectivity scales with the surface of the sample, these small samples compared to the 100 times or 20 times bigger sample in, in soft matter, that you're really limited with intensity in these experiments and measurements can take hours, uh, if not days. So at this point, uh, we should reveal um, what you have answered in the question. And it looks like we have a fully neutron aware audience, which is nice for my uh, upcoming slides too. And uh, also a lot of you have some reflectometry experience. So I think I can keep the, um, the background a bit lower. Uh, so I thank you for those answers. And uh, we'll continue with the uh, neutron reflectivity instrumentation. So uh, the standard ways of uh, neutron reflectometry, how it was done since its invention is basically having a well collimated incoming beam hitting the sample and uh, either you're using a monochromatized beam and scan the angle of the sample and with this access different QZ values or you're using um, a pulsed beam uh, under one incident angle or a few and then use the time of flight of the neutrons to determine the wavelength and with this different uh, Q values. But there, um, it was realized that there are options to improve the intensity that you can measure by making use of the fact that the specular intensity is orders of magnitude stronger than any other and that uh, the incident and outgoing angle are always the same. So the first example I wanna give here is the rainbows uh, system that's developed at uh, ILL, where you still use a collimated beam coming in. Here, this is a, a non-monochromized, non-pulsed white beam. Um, and you measure a reference where this beam hits a prism under a small angle, then you have the refraction effect, changing the angle dependent on the wavelength, and then you use a position sensitive detector to detect this, uh, the change in angle by wavelength. And then you make a second measurement where the second slit is your sample, and the reflected beam keeps colli uh, stays collimated as before, so you can also send this through the prism and split up the wavelength, and you can see here, this is the detector location on the x-axis, and uh, the right side would be longer wavelength. So at the beginning, the green and the red, which is the sample and the uh, reference beam, line up because you are in total reflection. And here, this would be the uh, uh, critical edge of total reflection. And then the sample gets um, uh, oscillates, which is uh, due to the film on top. And you can then divide the two signals by each other and calculate the Q values and you're getting this kind of reflectivity measurement here. Um, and th those line up very well with standard time of flight measurements made earlier. And for this, they expect a factor of 15 to 30 compared to what can be done today with the D17 flagship instrument at ILL. Now, they, this is uh, still under development, especially the detector de technology is a limiting factor because you get very high account rates. A second approach to uh, make use of um, the incident outgoing angle being the same is uh, the focusing reflectometry approach that's being uh, used in the upgrade of, of the AMI instrument at PSI that's uh, being finished right now, and also in the concept for the SDI instrument that's built for ESS. Here, you um, hit the sample with a beam that has a pretty large divergence here, 1.5 degrees. Uh, and then you use the detector 
to measure what was the specular reflectivity angle. And uh, then together with the time of flight, you can combine those uh, two informations to get again a specular reflectivity. With this, the gain factor is also in the order of 15 to 30 just by increasing the divergence that hits the sample. And uh, we're using the so-called Selene guide uh, fo focusing technology to um, keep the background low by only hitting the sample surface and no uh, surrounding media. And here you can see a simulation of the SDI instrument uh, where you can measure a, a standard square centimeter sample in just a few seconds up to very high Q ranges. Some kind of hybrid between the two systems is the uh, Condor instrument, which is now under commissioning at NIST in, uh, in Washington. And uh, instead of the SDR instrument having a continuous divergence, they produce uh, several single beams that are co each collimated, uh, hitting the sample again, uh, all focused to the sample position. And then on the outgoing side, each of those beams hits one column of, um, of uh, monochromator crystals. So the beam can pass through crystals which don't have the right angle to select the wavelengths. And so different uh, angles of crystals will extract different wavelengths. And so they have something like 50 uh, crystals in one row over uh, several of those beams leading to huge possible gains. Here the factor of 20 to 50 to their normal monochromatic instruments. And here you see the first measurements being taken there um, in the commissioning, uh, showing very high resolution while still having extreme high intensities. So at this point, you can really gain from the in interactivity with our poles by choosing what is the uh, part of the uh, uh, where I should go more into detail what we are doing with the SDI instrument. And I will take also a few questions if you have any. So just raise your hand if you want to ask something. There was one attendee who raised the hand, but then I think he was afraid to do so and uh, I think unraised he's live it now. again. <laughs> Agarwal is uh, Agarwal. Now. I was to unmute. Let's see if that works. Hmm. No. Or oh, Steph, can you unmute Agarwal? He's unmuted. Agawa, do you want to ask a question? It does not seem to be the case. So, well, I'm, well <laughs> I was afraid that it will be polarization analysis, Arthur. <laughs> it is polarization analysis. Yes, so the, the this, is, this is a, a very close call. Uh, I'm uh, surprised that there's uh, so much interest in the polarization, but that's uh, why I did this question. So we will continue with this part of the talk. So uh, there's, there are two challenges for polarization analysis uh, on the SDI instrument. One is that we want to use a very large uh, beam wa uh, wavelength band and that the divergence of 1.5 uh, degrees uh, is quite large uh, and you want to cover all of that, but you can make use of the advantage of having uh, this focusing beam geometry uh, that you know that close to the sample, the beam will be very small. So we have a polarization device between the two guides of the Selene guide in the first focus. And then we have an analyzer on the detector arm and both of them use the same uh, idea of having a, a curved guide that uh, 
basically follows the angle of the, be the beam should have when they come from the center of the sample. So first on the polarizer side, um, when we, we don't want to disturb the direction of the beam. So we uh, do not want to use reflective uh, mirrors, but uh, use uh, double coat side coated uh, transmission devices. And here you can see the shape the mirror follows is a logarithmic spiral, which uh, has the probability, uh, probability the, um, uh, the uh, intrinsic property that the angle between a beam from the center to any point on uh, the spiral is always the same, which is optimal for a polarizing super mirror. Obviously the beam is not a point source, but a bit bigger. Uh, and this is why we also consider uh, the size of the beam in doing some simulations. And for SDR, we want to cover a band uh, that we can reach when we do some um, uh, uh, second uh, or third uh, pulse um, skipping modes. So we extend the wavelength band over our shortest wavelength range. And this means we want to cover 3.75 angstrom to at least 22 angstrom. Uh, but we also use the uh, uh, transmission polarizer, polarizer property of having total reflection for both um, uh, uh, spin states at a very long wavelength uh, to cut out frame overlap that we would otherwise get above 30 angstrom wavelength. This is a simulation of uh, one such polarizer. So this would be the focus of um, uh, between the two uh, elliptical guides. This would be the first and this would be the second analyzer mirror. This is just um, looking at the second one. And you can see here versus wavelength, um, uh, the transmission where 50% means uh, all of the spin up. Uh, so 40% is a loss of about uh, 10 to 20% of the needed neutrons. And the red line here would be the polarization. And at the top, you see, this is a standard band we have when we use the 14 uh, Hertz of ESS. Uh, this would be the band when we have two, uh, I would skip every second pulse. And this would be the band um, when we just uh, use every third pulse of the beam. So you can see that only in the shortest wavelength, the polarization isn't so good, um, which is typical for a transmission polarizer. So when we add a second polarizer that is under a little bit different angle to make to to uh, keep the losses as low, lower longer wavelength uh, low, we're getting something like 99% polarization of the full huge wavelength range and the full divergence of the beam that we're using. This drops our intensity, especially to long wavelengths, um, but the loss at the main band between four and eleven angstrom is uh, not so big while still getting this huge increase in uh, polarization. And on the other hand, the very long wavelength um, measure the intensity of uh, reflectivity at lower Q, which is orders of magnitude higher, so that we can live with this loss without needing to increase counting times. Um, on the other analyzer side, we have to use a bit of a different approach because we have to be downstream of the sample focus, obviously. Um, and we also want to make, uh, uh, have the possibility to use both spin states. So we are using a, a larger curved mirror that's actually in the plane of the sample. So it doesn't disturb the scattering angle um, in reflectivity or off specular scattering. And then we use one reflection on one part of the detector to get the spin up. Um, uh, state, and then we use a single transmission and a double transmission mirror for the uh, spin down state. And here you can see the simulation again of this um, using the two uh, polarizing transmission mirrors. You have the blue curve, so again, uh, 98 to 99 percent polarization, and also a quite decent 30 percent transmission for these neutrons, which drops again to longer wavelength quite drastically, while the uh, polarization of the reflected beam is the green line here. So it drops with longer wavelength um, and the transmission is almost perfect. 
Um, but uh, this also shows that at longer wavelength for this several, uh, for the long um, pulse skipping modes, the polarization is very bad of the reflected beam. So this is probably only be going to be used uh, with the main um, highest intensity band using full 14 Hertz of the uh, ESS source, which makes sense as polarization analysis will also mostly be done um, uh, with the highest intensity available because of the losses you already have. What comes with this idea of a large curved polarizing mirror is also the need uh, for very large and strong guide fields because the uh, mirror at the analyzer at the end has something like 30 centimeter width uh, reaching uh, our goal of about 50 millitesla uh, guide field there is quite hard and we started looking into options to, to get this guide field uh, large enough and one of those concepts currently employed is this kind of um, circular structure of a Halbach geometry where you get very homogeneous intensities, uh, uh, magnetic field strength and directions. Uh, and what you can see here and also compared to a second idea is that at the end, we, we're not still, still not reaching the strength of the field that we want, but we are relatively close with 35, 40 milliteslas. And at the beginning of the mirror where it's less wide, the strength is high enough. Uh, so with this, I want to thank uh, the STI design team for all their efforts in these different parts of the instrument. Um, I would open up to some more questions if there are any. There was one question by, I guess it's Frederick Ott and not Hans Ruedi Ott from ETH. And he asks if uh, besides reducing measuring, measuring times, is there a hope to achieve measurements below reflectivity of 10 to the minus five to 10 to the minus six. So today's state of the art is 10 to the minus seven. Um, but it, this strongly depends on the size of the sample. These techniques of increasing intensity uh, don't get you to lower uh, reflectivities because they actually uh, will increase the background. Uh, uh, so, so the ratio intensity to background will be lower because you have more beam hitting the sample um, but for most of the uh, small samples uh, uh, in hard matter, it's not the limiting factor to run in the background, but it's mostly that you just cannot measure long enough to go above 10 to the minus five or sometimes 10 to the minus six is also possible. Okay, Arthur, I think then you can continue with Chisans and there seems to be a need to explain that from the poll. Yeah, so um, the rest of my talk will be about the, the Gizans part. So basically grazing incidents, scattering that's not reflectometry, because my feeling is with all those new techniques, we actually have everything we need to do all the science that's interesting in magnetism and thin films. Um, any kind of improvements will just be making experiments a bit better uh, to, to run, but not opening new uh, scientific fields. Um, so uh, if you have nanostructures that are not homogeneous, you might want to know more about their magnetic interactions. And so th then many would ask, why not do this in small angle neutron scattering? This has a exp uh, is much easier to um, do uh, in experiments on. It's um, uh, you, you have some options on, of contrast matching that can make the interpretation a bit easier. Uh, you, and uh, with Gizans, you cannot use the Bonnick approximation anymore because you're close to the critical edge of total reflection. And um, also this makes the modeling more complicated. So why would you go through the hassle of doing that? And there I can say that, especially for magnetism, scattering intensity is almost always the limiting factor. If you don't use the highest magnetization materials, but something that's just uh, interesting in physics, the moments will be lower, the scattering will be lower. And so what you can gain out of GSUNs is having an enhancement of the scattering close to the critical edge. And this can be an order of magnitude or more that you enhance it, um, which can make a, a huge difference. Uh, you also have access to some 
vertical cor correlations. That's interesting when you're going to more 3D structures or uh, nanostructured um, uh, heterostructures. And you have, it can get some depth sensitivity that's mostly used in soft matter. Uh, and there are actually uh, quite some developments also concerning the software, which makes it much easier to model these kind of systems in the distorted wave born approximation uh, than it used to be. So even users without being experts in the technique have now some chances to look into it. And the surface sensitivity, I want to give you a little bit of a, um, of a teaser how this could look like. So on the left, you see measurements we did at SNS um, on some um, polymer self-assembled structure where you can see dependent on what we call PI, which is similar to having a changed uh, incident angle with a monochromatic uh, instrument, you see that some of the structures only show up uh, at very uh, limited uh, range. And uh, it's maybe a bit hard to see here, but you get some dots around the specular here that then change to some kind of half circle. And you start getting transmitted uh, small angle scattering of this system. So you get different depth sensitivities and the structure is somehow 3D. And on the right, you see some um, simulation of a magnetic structure of stripe arrays with, with, with antiferromagnetic order. And uh, changing the incident angle, uh, you see this is a logarithmic intensity scale that only in a, a few fractions of a degrees, you get an increasing gain of more than a factor of 10 compared to the neighboring angles. So this can be used uh, very effectively. Systems you can look into would be, for example, the skirmion lattices that I talked about before, where you have uh, this kind of um, rotating spins uh, with a center point that, that is um, topologically protected. And they can also form some kind of skirmion lattices. Uh, and in thin films, they are now being uh, uh, investigated uh, uh, out of non-skirmion ma materials forming just due to interface systems and those have a very low amount of material that might be very hard in suns to, to see. Other options of the future where the nanoparticle community is going is some kind of 3D nanostructures that uh, might be interesting for also from a magnetic point of view. Um, stuff happening at uh, magnetic boundaries like uh, here this kind of uh, spin changes close to some um, uh, domain wall. Uh, these kind of self-assembled nanoparticle structures, uh, sometimes called mesocrystals, that uh, give uh, very highly ordered structural um, systems of dipole interacting uh, magnetic system moments, uh, similar to what you can see here in this uh, two different structures ordering, uh, like in single crystals, and they. Uh, there's theory that there are some interesting vortex-like states and other short-range uh, ordered magnetic states that, that will not have a very strong scattering because the range is just uh, five or ten uh, neighbors. And other options would be embedded particles where you cannot uh, use any microscopy technique to access them um, and where there's also some self-assembly going on. Example of what can be done today and how we are limited by the samples uh, we just recently measured uh, in Garching. So this is a sample of um, permalloy cylinders on triangle lattices. So this is a frustrated system because spins can only point up or down due to the shape anisotropy. And the structure of those systems uh, here were very good. So you can see if you rotate the sample around the sample normal, you have a break peak coming up left and right of the specular peak that's extremely strong. Here, something like 50% of the specular beam uh, uh, at the peak. And so th this shows how well this uh, structure is over the whole sample. So this is not a powder like in self-assembled systems. And so this is an E-beam sample, so size limited. This is permalloy, so the strongest magnetic moment, you, or, or very strong magnetic moment. And still, we needed more than eight hours of counting to get this relatively good data. And uh, you can see here that this is the 
the right is the measurement and the left is some preliminary simulation of some mixed ordered, uh, short range ordered state. And you, this is a, a non-compressed triangular lattice. Uh, and you see you have something like a factor of five to 10 higher magnetic signal than the background. And if you compress this lattice a little bit, um, you get a different kind of order, which uh, is one directional kind of stripe order like shown here. Um, so it is possible to investigate this on current instruments, but if you imagine that you will have not a single crystal, but a arbitrarily oriented powder in plane, this is a factor of 100 in intensity, so there wouldn't be any chance to measure this. So where could we go with this? Um, current state of the art, uh, maybe one of the best, if not the best instruments for these kind of uh, systems would be the D33 at ILL. Um, and when you look into uh, what they are doing, uh, this is a SANS instrument with basically almost 100% brilliance transfer. You can get the resolutions that you need without um, uh, losses that you wouldn't expect from just increasing resolution. Um, and I would say uh, with a, uh, you can also match the wavelength with a, a velocity selector, the resolution very well to what you need. So there's basically nothing you could do in theory to improve this because you are close to uh, the optimum unless you in increase the number of neutrons coming out of your cold moderator. So what could we do? It's uh, basically uh, the new neutron sources that are being built right now where you have this huge gains in, in peak brilliance and also overall uh, brilliance that can be used here. The, the blue one would be the ESS five megawatt pulse and the black one is what's um, planned for the uh, SNS second target station, which is much, much uh, shorter beam with a very high peak brilliance. Um, and so uh, compared to the small line here, ILL, one would think this is uh, this would also be a game changer uh, in this regard. Especially looking in the ESS example, when looking at where could you put typical detectors for these kind of uh, instruments, you find that uh, a resolution between three and 8% is achievable without any uh, additional shaping of the pulse, uh, which sounds like the perfect resolution for a GSANS uh, magnetic experiment. And you get spectrum, um, uh, bandwidth between five, uh, five and 10 or uh, angstroms or five and 15, depending on where you put the detector. So what's the problem with this? Doesn't this mean we have automatically solved our intensity problem uh, that we had before? Well, not so much. If you remember what I showed you with the surface sensitivity of this uh, magnetic enhancement, but which we want to gain, um, only about 20% of the Q value um, is around this uh, region of enhancement. So if you have a um, beam that has a factor of two or uh, a factor of three uh, bandwidth, you would only be able to use effectively a, a few 10% of this beam. Uh, so you have to think about ways to better uh, change the incident K vector to keep it close to this uh, optimal value. And um, I'm aware of two me such methods besides the possibility of some kind of uh, changes in the incoming beam itself. Uh, one would be putting in some kind of uh, prism in front of the sample that uh, refracts the um, beam slightly. Uh, this is again wavelength dependent and that was uh, done already on, on um, for some soft matter experiments. And here you see their simulation uh, that the green line would be the corrected uh, penetration depth with, which directly depends on the incident K vector while the blue line would be what you have just in time of light. So this looks very promising while I see some issues if you're going to the, those kind of soft uh, from the soft matter to the hard matter samples, the sample size will be much smaller. So the change of the position of the beam on the sample will make a more important effect. And also the distance between the uh, 
prism and the sample has to be bigger. So uh, this offset could lead to a need for a much bigger beam and therefore much higher background. So this has to be tested. Another option could be uh, dynamically changing the sample angle, with, for example, with a piezo stack. As you are using small samples anyway, there's not much mass you have to move. And you could do this in the frequency of the incoming beam and therefore just um, keep the incident k vector constant. And with this, um, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, Arthur, for this nice presentation. And uh, there are three questions and I will start with one by Christy Kinane from ISIS. What do you estimate is the smallest moment you will be able to measure? Um, with SDI, I assume um, this it will strongly depend on the contrasts. Um, today, I would say a tenth of a Bohr magneton or maybe uh, a, few, a few three, five percent uh, is definitely possible. And um, I think with SDR, we can probably also push down the background in conventional measurements. So maybe yeah, one percent of a Bohr magneton per, per uh, formula unit might be possible. And uh, another one by, again, Frederick Ott. So what is the permaloy sample surface? Um, so I assume the question is if it's in some kind of, of matrix or something similar. So in, in this experiment, um, the sample was uh, built within uh, with some kind of uh, alumina, um, uh, uh, not alumina, so some kind of PMMA uh, photoresist uh, and then grown on gold. So basically we have silicon, gold, and then just the permalloy structure and then the, um, uh, uh, the photoresist was re resolved. So it's in air. And I can just continue. In, in, so again, Frederick asks, isn't GSANS better implemented on a stance machine so that you can tune the QY range of interest? Yes and no, this depends. The, the advantage of a SANS is mostly that you, uh, with the long collimation, you can measure large samples and still have a very high resolution. In this sample, for example, the, the size of the structured area is just five millimeters. Uh, in the reflection direction, you have no gain in SANS. In the uh, GSANS direction, you would have a gain if the sample is bigger. So here in Maria, the distance of the collimation is still four meters. So it might be we would mm -hmm. gain a little bit uh, with a bit bigger, but it's not much for this sample. And the main thing we need here is a good polarization analysis. That's not so often in SANS. Um, and also uh, the nice adjustment of the angle and the outgoing angle of the beam um, but I, I'm sure that you could do this also in science. I don't think it's going to be better per se. Yeah, but then, okay, then another question is, could you give a brief comparison between chi science and off-specular scattering? Uh, the main difference, uh, there, there are two differences. One is the physics, because the QX direction is uh, much smaller changes per angle than the QY direction, you access different size ranges. And the other is experimentally off specular, you can do with a completely divergent beam in the sample plane. So you have much higher intensities available while in GSANS you need resolution in both directions. Then a question from Eddie Lelivire Bernard, I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Most likely not, so forgive me. So do you think that measuring transverse polarization components may bring additional information on a reflectometer? So it means using spherical neutron polarimetry instead of the uniaxial polarization analysis that you presented. I would say not if you are interested in specular because there's no uh, information gain for off specular and um, GSANS, I definitely see the, the gain there. And we were looking in for this experiment also changing the polarization direction. Um, if we could use here just one direction and with a spin flip, we could still 
distinguish two moment directions in the sample, but we couldn't distinguish a th third one very well. So if you have the option uh, for this kind of antiferromagnetically or uh, uh, cor uh, antiferromagnetic correlated systems to change the spin direction, I, I think this is a gain and it's not so hard to, to put on an instrument. And there seem to be a lot of fans on uh, polarization analysis. Another one, you did not talk about three helium for polarization analysis at pulsed sources. Is it not an option at all? It is an option, but for cold neutrons, um, there, there have, have to be really good reasons to use helium. As I see it, there, uh, when you look into the efficiency of the polarization, the Solid state devices always, almost always trump the helium device, but the helium has some advantages that, that are uniquely used, needed in some experiments. For example, in suns, I would definitely think this is a good option because you don't disturb your beam. Um, and uh, there are also some other examples like very short wavelength where you really have to uh, use the helium because you cannot get those small angles uh, but in reflectometry, um, I think almost any reflectometer, even with a big band, will have better performance with uh, solid states than with helium, and it's much easier to implement. Okay, and then a, a, a final question here from Jens Birch. Technically, how are the area detector readouts managed for the different energies timings? Um, so I assume also this question is about the SDI instrument. So I, I can just briefly go through what I didn't show you about uh, the te detector technology. So for this, this is a Boron-based system under a small angle. So um, there are a couple of those plates. Um, uh, so you distribute the uh, neutron beam much more over a larger surface, which helps reducing the counts per area. And then you distribute it over several cassettes that are read out separately, and this allows us to uh, drastically increase the uh, capabilities of counting rate. So um, uh, the tests performed so far, we reached 3.5 kilohertz per square millimeter, and this was limited by the digitizer electronics. So we hope we can improve this even more, but this is already something like 20 times the helium state of the art um, that other instruments use. <clears throat> Okay, then I don't see any more questions, but don't run away. I think there was another poll about lens, Steph. Yeah, because I would be interested, you know, if you knew lens before and where do you know it from, so please vote. And I hope now you all know what lens is. And uh, while you are polling, so we had in peak times about 90 participants on Zoom and another 20 on YouTube. I think this is quite great. So thanks for joining. And also thanks a lot for being so actively involved in polling and in asking good questions. And we intend to have this seminar once a month. So next one will be end of July, beginning of August. And I'm very happy because you with 60% vote for polarization, you will be happy to hear that the talk will be given by Goran Nielsen from ISS on uniaxial polarization analysis on the LET time of light spectrometer. And I hope to see you then again uh, on this talk from Goran. And now I wish you a, a happy, a nice day. And uh, thanks for joining. <laughs>